This is the Nobel Podcast, where we talk about how to optimize your technology, life, and mind. We're joined by special operations veterans, entrepreneurs, investors, and others who have overcome difficulty to make it to the top of their craft by staying in the fight. So what is your name? My name is Adam Carouse, and looks like Caraguzo if you look at the way it's spelled. All right, rock and roll. Where'd you grow up? So I grew up actually here in the Finger Lakes, which is part of Western New York, supposedly carved by glaciers many, many moons ago. And then as a kid, so when I, I came up here, it's super blue color, lots of flags, lots of woods, lots of fields. What was your, what was your childhood like? Yeah, so grew up small town, small town life, you know, ride your bike around. You know, I think about it now and it's like, well, you know, it's quite different from, you know, the way kids grew up today. But yeah, I grew up, you know, I could ride my bike all over the town, town of about 10,000 people, ride my bike to the bookstore, library, and then started running. So I ran track and cross country growing up. And that kind of helped develop like mental toughness that would come in handy later. And yeah, so I worked, what did I do? So I bust tables, I waited tables, I developed x-rays before that job became obsolete. Did you get into trouble when you were a kid? Yes. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely got into trouble as a kid. I made a lot of poor decisions, which is like, it's, uh, it's coming handy now, ra raising children of my own. I've made a lot of, I made a lot of dumb decisions when I was a kid. It reminds me, I was talking to my, one of my troop chiefs and he, he was talking about, you know, doing the security clearance investigation and the, uh, you know, the investigator's like, did you get into trouble when you were a kid? And, and he said, yeah, you know, the normal stuff. <laughs> and the, and the investigator's like, what's the normal stuff? He goes, yeah, you know, shoplifting, vandalism. <laughs> and the investigator's like, what? That's the normal stuff? But yeah, I mean, just, yeah, there was a lot of up to no goodness for a little while. No, I mean, not like, you know, you're getting sent away to like a home stuff, but just the more innocuous, some garden variety vandalism, shoplifting, you know, the, and then getting into high school, obviously the, uh, you know, the bonfire parties, the keg parties, all that sort of things that you get up to no good in a small town. You were obviously a SEAL for a, a long career, which we'll get into, but leading from that, that as a kid, lots of library, lots of books, a little bit of trouble, a good bonfire, backcountry, being raised up in that kind of environment, you ended up enlisting as an undesignated seaman, which mm -hmm. in the Navy is an E1. It's the lowest rank, the lowest status, the lowest responsibility. And I'm just curious, how did you end up there? Back in the day, it was called the Dive Fair Program, which was like the pathway to BUDS. So I was in the Dive Fair Program. Then I switched to nuke on a sub. And so then, you did want to be a SEAL. Oh, yeah. Oh, I wanted oh. to be a SEAL. Yeah, I wanted to be a SEAL though, from, let me back up. So fifth grade, I wanted to be a Marine. That's really kind of like. What, that got, was, what got you? So what got, you know, it's interesting, like the power of images. So if you remember in Boondock Saints, they were like, there's this whole bit where they're like making fun of rope and they're like, you always have rope, you know, like. Chuck Norris always says rope. And so there's this image of a Marine with like black face paint and he's got like, he's got rope coiled on his shoulder. And I, and I was just like that. I'm like, man, I want to be that. Like, boondock Saints rock on. Like, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to throw in a Boondock Saints reference, but so I want to be a Marine, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade. And then this is either people are either going to chuckle or they're going to cringe. But watching the movie Navy SEALs, Mm -hmm. There's a scene in the beginning where Hawkins wakes up, Charlie Sheen's character, wakes up on the, the beach. And um, I actually have a false memory of the beginning of this movie. Like, I, I've invented a, a beginning that never happened. But in my beginning, he wakes up and he stands up and there's like a woman's high heel like in his, like, was it like there, like crunched against the sand when he stands up and then it cuts to a cruise ship. And the implication was like he jumped off the cruise ship and like swam ashore after like a wild night. That is a complete fabrication in my mind. But what actually happens, he stands up and then they're like, where, you know, where's Graham? He's getting married in 45 minutes. 
And like in that moment, I was like, I want to do what those guys do. And I don't know what that is about, right? It's like there's an element of like roguishness, roguishness or rascality to being a frogman. And that there that attracted me. I don't know why. But that's yeah, that did it. These guys that could just do anything. They can go in any domain and excel. And there's something about that that was very like attractive. So there's yeah. a pivot from Marine to that. Did you read Rogue Warrior by chance? Of course. Oh, of course. So it all came out when I was in high school. Yeah. All those books. So I like read I read like the first four, I think, you know, when he started to venture into like fiction and that. But yeah, obviously the like bench pressing in the prison yard in winter and all that stuff. So if you had the option to go nuke, that means you obviously had the, the intellectual capacity for some for for college. Did you, did you think about going to college first or was it straight up? I want to drop out. I want to go to enlist right now. Yeah. So my family couldn't afford to pay for college. I didn't really put together like I could take out loans at the time. So this is like mid 90s, late 90s. And I like looked at ROTC, but I didn't really apply for like a ROTC scholarship. So I really didn't like put it two and two together appropriately for like college to to pay for it myself so i was just like well enlisting is you know this is what i'll do for now so let's get into it so you got in you were thinking about you wanted to go teams you thought about nuke end up undesignated seaman how did yeah. that happen there was actually like a sub cook i was gonna be a sub cook in my contract and then you know ended up like lost all those and then basically just came in undesignated and then it's you know with the recruiter sells it in a you know a favorable they put lipstick on that pig right and they're like well you go in there and you check out all the jobs and you can kind of like figure out what job you want to do which and you know that sounds great in theory in actuality it's like yeah you're in deck department bro like that's your chip and paint like that's what you're doing and that's what i ended up doing but i loved it i love being a bosun mate i got to bm2 on a ship before i went to buds in about two and a half years. And then like, I, I was lucky. I had a chain of command that they're like, yep, you're a hard worker. We'll support your package to buds. You know, I, they're, you know, I've heard tons of horror stories of people that, uh, they, they were hard workers and their chain of commands like, nope, you're a hard worker. We can't lose you. But I was lucky. I was fortunate. And they supported me. And then I got orders to buds in summer, fall of 99, 1999. So yeah. Years before nine 11. Yeah. And, your class was unique. I read about your class when I was getting ready to go to Buzz through Dick Couch's book. So maybe maybe talk about what. Yeah. So we've talked about Buzz on the podcast before. Maybe talk about what it's like going through Buzz and then knowing you're being fully documented the yeah. entire time. Yeah. You know, it's like I thought that book was lost to the mists oh, of no, history, it's but it's definitely yeah, it's still out there. So I I think I may have a record for like the shortest amount of time at Buzz because I checked in on a Friday. We started PTRR, which is like the two week like pre-training it's called something else now but basically it's a two week pre-training before you start first phase so i checked in on friday that started on monday and then and then i went straight through the class didn't get rolled and then graduated so i was literally there six and a half months but i checked in on a friday and the first thing i remember walking across the grinder and i saw you know got you know the officers have like that line on their helmet just a solid line to denote their rank and I saw an ensign like swabbing the grinder. And for me, this was like a revolutionary experience. I was like, how is there an officer swabbing the grinder? Like, isn't there another like, you know, enlisted guy that can do that? And so that was my first like, whoa, like this is not going to be like what I'm used to in the Navy. Seeing an officer doing like manual labor like that. But um, I went in, met the OIC and then, you know, got into that horrible building 602, which is just still like, I just have nightmares about that building. It was just so awful, but just dropped into like intense, you know, the intensity, you know, like that's, I remember the intensity of those first days where it's like, you're up at three or four in the morning and you're just getting like completely hammered and like dudes are just dropping like flies or just quitting left and right. But then you're like on the beach, you know, it's like, there's this like, you know, the, you're on this like amazing real estate, you know, patch of real estate. And then you have weekends in Coronado and it's just like Coronado is just a magical place to be. Yeah. So it's just intense. Uh, I mean, I don't know how else to describe it, but you're, yeah. Like I wrote a poem about it because I was like, this is so like such a weird experience. I want to try to chronicle it, but you know, it's just tight. You know, like the guys that you go through buds with, you're just so tight with 
because you've experienced all this like massive suffering together. So, so couch. So, you know, we knew off the bat he was, he was watching us and I think I felt like relieved because I was like, well, if they, they can't kill us because he's watching us, you know? But if they kill us, at least he'll be there to like tell the story. Was he like rolling around in a minivan? Was he running with you? No. So he would just kind of be there. Like he's kind of a little guy. So he would, he would just kind of be shadowing us, you know, kind of walking around. And then periodically through training, he would like give us questionnaires and he would have like little, you know, you go to like Mary calendars or somewhere and like, he'd like interview you and like kind of, he'd pull out like little vignettes about stuff that happened, but he was just there kind of in the shadows watching us silent observer. What, uh. Were you LPO? I was actually, I was not. Yeah. There was two other E5s there. So there was, I think, well, there's four, I think there are four E5s and there was some E6s, but they all quit. So my roommate ended up being the, the LPO for most of training John Owens, but yeah, I never got, I was like next in line, but he also made it all through training. So, you know, I never had the chance to be the LPO. So from some of the guys we talked to, some of them said Buds was beautiful. Budge was life-changing, and then some of them said Budge was the worst thing they've ever experienced in their life. We've had the full extreme where yeah. you fall. I, I mean, I, I fall s- s- perfectly in the middle, because it's like, I will say, like, it was like the best six months of my life and the worst six months of my life, because it was, like, so transcendent. I, that's, like, the only way I can describe it, because it's like, you are seeing the secrets of, I don't, like, I don't think I'm being, like, hyperbolic right now. Like, you're seeing the secrets of reality. You're seeing how far a human can go, can be pushed. Like, I don't, I just don't know. Like, and this could be bias, like speaking, right? I don't know if the other training programs do the same thing. Like maybe, you know, you got the long walk that like SAS or Delta does. And maybe that like, have you never experienced those things? I can't say for sure. Right. But like doing hell week, like in that one intense five and a half days, like you see, like everything falls away and you're like, like what I thought was a limit is not a limit. It's like, that was just laughable. Like I thought that was a limit. That's not a limit. So you get to see behind like the veils of reality and you get to like feel the intensity of connection with, you know, your teammates and you're just in it and you like, look, you can like look each other in the eye and you're like, I'm here for you. You're here for me. We're going to get through this together. And that's, I don't know. It's magical. And yeah, like you said, and then it's awful, right? I think somebody on your podcast was like, you know, the instructor going through a divorce that like comes and is like, all right. I'm like, that's totally, I got totally remember that. Like, you know, like eight o'clock on a Friday night and like somebody leaves their room unlocked and it's like the pain train is coming. So yes, there's that side of it. And it's like, that's not fair, but you know, life isn't fair. Sorry, buddy. And so there's just joy and pain and, and it's all rolled into one. And it's like, I don't know. So I think I'm just grateful that I got to do it. You know, like I feel just humbled that I got to do it. Yeah. I mean, the intensity leaves a lot of like images in the brain. So if you had an image, what was the the clearest, like maybe most powerful, most painful image you have in that first three weeks, including Hell Week? Is there one moment that was like, shit, this was it? Yes. All right. So there's this moment that I I try to describe it to people. And I don't know how, if I'm doing like that good job of describing it, but it's, it's like a psychedelic moment. That's the only way I can describe it. And so it's like, it's like Monday afternoon of hell week. So we're moving around and we're like, we got the boats on our heads. We're running. And this is like, obviously the old, I haven't even seen the new compound, but the old compounds up, you know, by the amphibious base. And we're like running with the boats on our heads. And there's these like beach markers that were there for like old, you know, amphibious operations. Right. And they're like, you know, they're kind of like an H shape but they're only like about four feet wide between the stanchions and the instructors are like down boat. And they're like, you know, boat crew two, get your boat through these stanchions. And we're like, just going to town. Like we're trying to execute and we're like trying to slam this boat through these stanchions. And it's clear, like the boat is way too wide to get through these stanchions. And I like look up at the instructors, like out of the corner of my eye as we're doing it. And there's like two of them just looking at each other, like, look at these idiots, like (laughs) these, look at these dummies trying to do this. And I, in that moment, it was like, that was, it was like this, I dropped into like a state that I can only describe as psychedelic. And I was like, I'm going to make it through hell week. And I knew it. And I was like, they, I mean, they can murder me and I won't make it through, but short of murdering me, I will make it through hell week. And I think everybody goes through that moment. Some people it's like Tuesday night, some people it's Wednesday night. So I've always felt like very lucky that it like happened to me like Monday afternoon 
And I was like, yeah, like I'm not afraid anymore. I felt just at peace because I was like, yeah, it's going to suck, like cool, but like, I'm going to make it. And I was just grateful for that. That's epic. <laughs> so you just retired 27 years. Yeah. 20, what was the exact 27? It was like 27 years? and a half. Yeah. That's so congratulations. Oh, thank you. That, that's epic. <laughs> so 27 you. years. We're talking about Buzz. You went through in 99. Yeah, 99. And then in, yeah, graduated April 2000. April 2000, yeah. which is obviously a year and a half before 9-11, which I guess we'll come to that. But let's talk about uh, checking into the teams. Where'd you go? Thoughts? Anything? Yeah. So back then, the teams were like geographically aligned. So we did this thing where we realigned them and kind of made them all standardized. But before then, you know, I spoke some Spanish. You know, I'm not like fluent, but I'm like, I'm decent. So I'm like, okay, I'll go to SEAL Team 4. They do South America. Got orders to SEAL Team 4. We did, you know, you do um, jump school on the way. So we, you know, we had like a massive road trip of like the guys in my class. We, you know, road tripped over to Fort Benning. We did like three weeks in Benning, just the awful, just Army Airborne School, which was like, you know, talk about like culture shock. You know, you're going from, you know, small team operations and third phase of BUDS. And, you know, there's like 20 guys in the class and then you go to like jump school and there's like, you know, 300 in the, in the class. And then you're just, you're in the machine. So that was like a huge shock. But then, you know, then, then we're on the road going back to Virginia beach and then checking into SEAL team four. That was still kind of like stuck in the nineties type stuff, you know, like OTBs, like very much like kind of that old Vietnam era stuff. We didn't have Navy Marine Corps parachutist wings yet because we hadn't done 10 jumps. We'd only done five. So, but they made us sew on the like army jump wings onto the camis before we got like our five jumps to like actually put on the Navy Marine Corps parachutes. So, you know, stuff like that. And then th this is back when you got to a team before you didn't have a Trident, right? And so you, like now, like you kind of get it at the schoolhouse, but back then you had to like go to a team, they checked you out. And each team had their own individual like process for like evaluating the individuals and then giving them a trident. So got to a team, got into back then it was called SEAL tactical training. So each coast ran their own SEAL tactical training and then got into that and then, you know, did our trident boards after that. Where were you when 9-11 happened? So we were down in Stennis, Mississippi doing, it used to be called an ORE, an operational readiness exercise. I think it's an FTX now, final training Okay. Exercise. So yeah, it's all meaning the same thing. It's like your final check as a maneuver element before you go on deployment. So we're doing that in Stennis, Mississippi. We're living in CB tents that flooded every afternoon. There was like a rainstorm. It was like, they put these CB tents up on like a baseball field and we're living in them. We're doing like, you know, CSAR, you know, combat search and rescue at night, you know, direct action missions and then coming back and, you know, trying to sleep through the day. We had just come back from you know, CSAR the night before everybody's trying to sleep and like somebody bursts into the tent and is like, Hey, a plane just hit the, you know, world trade center. So we all like run. And there was like a, we had like a media, like communication van that was connected to a tent that like the communication guys had and ran in there and somebody had like a TV on in there. And then we watched the second one hit on TV. And then we're just like, wow, like, you know, it's on now. Did you guys know what, what that meant back then? You know, it was such a, like a paradigm change. Like, and the only thing I under, I know how to compare it to is like my parents talking about when JFK died. Like it was like that level of like the, everybody's paradigm of the world shifted in that instance. And yeah, there were people that like warned that something like that could happen, but nobody was really like en masse, like prepared for it. And so, you know, we felt like, Hey, like we're here we've been training hard. Like we're ready to go. We're ready. We're ready to fight. So it was like a validation kind of up for all of us, you know, kind of that path, like choosing that path. So you were, you were super young, found out 9-11 happened. Was there even like an inkling in your mind that it would look the way it did the whole global, global war on terror did for 20 plus years? Uh, not, not immediately. I think, I think it took, it took a couple of years for that to sink in. And that's when I was like, okay, I can go to college and like actually get, you know, develop some actionable skills. So like after my third platoon, I went to college and then majored in like Middle Eastern studies and, and took Arabic. But, but yeah, immediately you're like, 
we have no idea how long this is going to take. I think all the human biases like come in where you're like, oh yeah, this will take, you know, you know, five minutes or this will take a year, but you don't really kind of see, you're just so like focused, you know, front side focused, but yeah, over time, you know, I think people realize, okay, this is going to take a long time. So let's talk about first couple of platoons. You said three platoons, yeah. then college. Is that when you, let's go, let's go through the platoon real right. quick and then college. Yeah. So first platoon, we ended up doing a Southcom deployment. So went down to like Columbia, we're based in Puerto Rico and then did a couple other countries there, came back, you know, obviously we're like very disappointed because yeah. that deployment was after 9-11. So we, you know, everybody wanted to get in the fight then, but it didn't happen. Second platoon came back. We shifted with the reorganization. We shifted to SEAL Team 2 and then deployed there to Iraq. We were up in Mosul doing direct action, and then we shifted down to Baghdad to stand up the protective detail down there. Ooh, how was Mosul? I'd say we're kind of like a SWAT SWAT team, you know, for the city. And, we, and it was just like, you know, manhunting was just kind of like we were starting to figure it out back then. This is like 04 we're starting to be like, how do we manhunt effectively? How do we start to like integrate all these various intelligences into like a system that will like get us after like individual X. And then like, you know, once we capture that guy, like turn him, you know, get, figure out who else is in the network. It's like all that stuff was just coming online, at least up, up there. What was like a a standard mission? Like, was it straight up DA? Can you walk through it? Yeah. So it's just, we had the Grob up there, which was amazing, like the Polish Grom. And they were like, th- those dudes were just characters. But, but yeah, we would just basically get, you know, intel. You know, I think just like the standard deployment, you know, you're kind of the vampire hours, right? Like your days are inverted. So, you know, you wake up late afternoon, you're like seeing what's going on, you know, seeing what targets maybe, you know, have good intelligence on them. And then gear prep. And then if, if things are moving towards, you know, fruition, you know, okay, hey, you know, we're going to, you know, op board this time. I don't even think we called it an op board in 04. It was probably still like a PLO at that point, like patrol leader's order. <laughs> like we hadn't like standardized our like terminology at, at that point. But um, yeah, so then, you know, we'd brief, you know, do some hasty rehearsals. Most of our stuff was like ground, like Humvees, unarmored Humvees back then. And then I can't even imagine that. Yeah. And a then a lot of lessons under those. Well, because yeah, because we, but this is before like IDs started like right. This deployment was like right when like IDs were becoming a big enough threat that was like, okay, we got to go armored. But our, you know, our mindset was like, these things are like fast and agile. We can just jump in and out of them quick. So kind of speed is our security, that, that kind of attitude. But yeah, you, you know, it'd be somewhere in the city and you'd roll out, you know, you have, guys on vehicles, guys to do isolation containment, and then, and then the assault force. So you just kind of figure out the neighborhood and figure out how you're going to approach it and then go in there and assault it. And then, you know, based on that, you know, you know, the tactical questioning, you know, do you need to like, are there any like follow ones you got to go to or, you know, flexing to, uh, and then, and then head home and then, you know, rejock and get ready to do it the next night. So South America, Iraq, what was your third deployment? Yeah. So third deployment, Went to Afghanistan like right after Red Wings. So went up in Bagram and it was still like early, you know, Bagram, you know, still wasn't like, I ended up going back to Bagram like later in my career. And like, it, you know, it was like just the monstrosity of like, yeah. you know, it looked like a, a CONUS base. A but pizza hut and everything. yeah, I mean, it's like the buildings, you know, all to like US code, yeah. you know, it's like, it's ridiculous. But um, back then it was just like the plywood huts type thing. So up in Bagram and, and I ended up like only being there for three months because I got picked up for Seaman Admiral, but didn't really get to do too much on that deployment. Like we went down to work with the Canadian SOF down in Kandahar, but really only did like probably three or four operations like on that in those three months, but definitely got to kind of see, you know, see the environment. So Seaman Admiral that's enlisted to officer the whole time. Did you want to become an officer? Or how did that come mm. about? So when I was on my ship, I thought about it. Like I had a division officer that was like really encouraging me to do it. You know, the division officer is like you're kind of your leader of like your group on the ship, like you're kind of mid-level manager leader. Uh, but he was encouraging me to go to the Naval Academy. You After know, three deployments, go to the Naval Academy? No, no, no. So oh, he was oh. um, 
this is back when I was still like, you know, 20 on right. the ship. He was like trying to get me to go to the Naval Academy. And I, I thought about it, but I realized, you know, it's probably gonna be a lot harder to go to buds as like an officer than as an enlisted guy, which is, you know, totally still true today. So I figured like I should, you know, definitely become a SEAL first. And then if I still was interested, you know, I can kind of go down that route. My pathway in the, in the enlisted side was like communications, JTAC, and then sniper. And, and so like, you know, obviously, as you know, like communication, JTAC, that kind of flows into like the officer mm -hmm. role because you're like, I, I view like the officer, the JTAC and the comm guy as like, there's like one big, you know, mind that are like sharing information on an operation. So that was just kind of a natural segue from those two roles up to, you know, ground force commander. I just looked at it, you know, where can I, where can I best contribute to this team? And I think, you know, I'm like, I think I, I have something to offer as an officer, so I can go do that. All right. So after that, you go back to the teams, 20 more deployments, however you want to sum up 27. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so then I go to, I do an AOIC at back at team four, go back to Iraq. Then I go to support activity two, which is now SRT two. you know, kind of like our Intel focused teams. And then selection training, you know, maritime mobility troop commander, you're, you know, I was in charge of a, uh, a troop of SWIX. That was a great tour. Hmm. Then I went to Naval postgraduate school, got my master's from Naval postgraduate school. I went to team eight, did a platoon commander there. I went to Europe and then back to Damneck, did a tour there. And then, and then I managed to secure a tour as a ROTC professor for the last <laughs> Last part of my career. So then I got to come teach uh, midshipmen and kind of help them get ready for the fleet and then retired out of there. So let's dig into the difference <laughs> between enlisted and officer. So like, okay. let's just, bef before we did like best and worst aspect of being enlisted. Yeah. And then we'll do the same thing, officer, and then we'll, we'll compare the two. Best parts about being enlisted. I think you get to, you get to deeply specialize in a craft you know, whatever it is, if you're jumping, you're a sniper, you're a breacher, you know, you get to just drill into that craft for years and just achieve mastery of it. Um, and there's something beautiful in that pursuit. And then just the camaraderie of like being like your enlisted bro, like that is like something that's amazing. Like just, I think just like there's a tightness when you're enlisted, I think that's awesome. The worst parts about being enlisted, I would say probably dudes will literally just like work themselves to death because culturally they're like, nah, man, I'm here. This is why I'm here to go to war. I want to train. I want to work on Saturdays. I want to like go on road trips. And then they'll, they will do that to the detriment of like their family and then to themselves. And they'll, they will literally like work themselves to death or to burnout, I should say. Unless somebody's there to kind of, you know, take care of them and be like, hey, bro, are you sure? Like, you you know, why don't you stay back on this trip and like, you know, watch your kid play soccer? There's also like a cultural expectation, I think, amongst enlisted guys of like, don't take a knee, you know, work hard, work hard, work hard. There is something like noble to that. It's like the pursuit of perfection and like execution on the battlefield. There is something like very like worthy about that, but it needs to be stewarded by like the wisdom to like, okay, you can, you know, you got to go off deployment to like, see the birth of your kid. That's going to force you to do that because like, you're going to regret that in 15 years. Like there's that element. So that would be probably the best and worst of like the enlisted side, the officer side. Well, the best part for me, I would say is like, you get to like, take care of dudes. Mm. Like, like you're, you get to like care for them and like, care for their career because like you know there's so much administrative bs in the military like you know fit reps evals awards sale of the quarter and like you know your average frogman like does not they're not into that you know what i mean like they're not into doing paperwork but like you can do that for them and like get them you know get them the evals that they need get them the awards they need get them recognized for the job they do and just help them on their career that's what i had the most satisfaction about is like taking care of dudes and then you get to and that's another i think i think that's another thing that frustrates guys when they're senior enlisted is like they've seen all the problems 
that they're like, hey, I know how to fix this. But as a senior enlisted guy, like your span of like ability to like change policy is is limited. So I see them like when they get to like E8 and E9, I see a lot of my friends were like frustrated because they're like, I know how to fix this problem, but I don't have the like, you know, the power, the, you know, organizational power like in this group to change it. But as an officer, like when you become an 05, like 06, you do have that power. Like you can make changes. So hopefully, you know, the 05s, 06s, they're listening to people and like making wise changes. The worst part about being an officer. Yeah, probably the like the connection. Like I didn't feel as connected with guys like when I was in O. Like, I mean, I had like, you know, you you develop close friendships. Like, you know, when you're you're in the arena together, like the troop commander and the troop chief, like you'll make strong connections there or like your fellow, you know, troop commanders, platoon commanders. But I didn't I didn't get to feel as connected. Being an officer, you really you you gotta be like such a generalist and then you're like moving every couple years from positions. So yeah, I guess that would be like the worst part is the connection. Can you compare the the brain between an enlisted guy and an officer, at least in the SEAL teams, and in your own opinion, is one more artistic, one more linear, one more oh. intuitive? Like, how do you actually think about the, the different operation of the brain, given the demands of the job, and maybe even the personalities drawn to either being enlisted I, or officer? Yeah. So I like, I love, I fucking love like frogmen because they're so artistic. Yep. And I like, I've always been just so like, I'm like, man, I'm so lucky to be in this community because it's like, the dudes are just so artistic and, um, and even like clearing, you know, clearing a building is such an artistic act. It's such a beautiful, like choreography of people, you know? So Jamie wheel, he talks about this and he's got recapture the rapture and stealing, stealing fire, stealing fire. He is, he talked to seals and kind of, he gets into this a little bit, like in stealing fire, kind of the mind that is created by the the mass of of men together they become this like super organism together and i tried to like articulate this to like one of my platoons and they're like they th- what they took away was like i was saying that they needed to be a porcupine moving through space <laughs> cuz i was trying to describe like you're just facing outward like 360 you know 720 degrees and you're just like this over you know like the platoon commander is like the, the higher brain functions. You got recce, you got the long guns, you got the heavy guns, you got the breachers. They're all like contributing to this massive creature that's moving through space together. And you're communicating over comms, you know, you're pushing situational awareness. So that is an amazing thing that is not related at all to the question you asked. So, art, so which minds are more artistic? Uh, Not even that, just uh, intuition. What's the difference between the enlisted brain and the officer brain? Uh, I mean, you know, first of all, like guys in our community are like way, you know, they're more educated than like the normal, like military person. Right. So like most, most enlisted guys I knew, like had a bachelor's, you know, so like some of them had like masters and some of them are like ridiculous, you know, brains. There's just more enlisted guys that are craftier, more pragmatic, just more intuitive, you know, when they're planning they're you know how do we how do we get in here how do we do this how do we get in without them detecting us all those things you know the the like enlisted guy that's like been around he had he's achieved like this mastery and kind of can put things together just in a very unique and creative way and then you'll see it like manifest and like you know the guys are like you know playing guitars they're doing this they're doing that they're building stuff that art, you know, the artistic side comes out in different ways, but I like to try to frame it. Like, you know, you've got the art, you've got the science, and then you've got like craftsmanship in the middle. And like, and so their craftsmanship is just, it's just great to like watch in action. I think, um, I've always like enjoyed watching like senior enlisted guys, like re- that really know their stuff, like just get to work and like, and think innovatively. And so, and then the officer side, like, there's creativity involved, but that like you're in the machine, like you're trying to like get work for the, for the men. So it's like, you got to like know all these just arcane administrative processes. You got to like, you got to schmooze, you know, the higher leadership that you're going to go work for work, the con ops approvals, all that stuff requires like the linear thinking, you know, there's definitely still creativity on the officer side to get, you know, especially like when you're like trying to find gainful employment for your boys like you got to be like making stuff happen so i don't know if that answers your question yeah yeah what about 
best leadership advice you could possibly give? I looked up your thesis. It seems like preparing to be unprepared is a major theme, but yeah, what would your best leadership advice be to anybody? I mean, I like I default to you know humility. I think and like I hope people don't hear humility and think like being passive or being timid. I hope people take away like you know like you don't think less of yourself. You think of yourself less. So there's so much that even like at the end of my career, I'm like, I have no idea about this. The individual mind has such limits to its ability to understand situations. So being humble enough to understand like when I have a wrong perception and I need to listen to the people around me, I would say like be humble and like kind of uh, take in other perspectives. Do you think maybe coming from the enlisted background made that a bit easier for you? Without a doubt. I mean, I think that was helpful. But I know, you know, I know plenty of officers that are able to to do that well, because I think you get, you know, it's like jujitsu, like, you, you know, you either be humble or you get humbled over time. So like the the ones that weren't humble and like, oh, well, I, you know, I know what to do here and like kind of go, go it on their own. They get, they get humbled over time and they're like, oh, wait a minute. Okay. I need to, you know, seek, seek counsel for this. What about best followership advice you could possibly give? Mm. I, I just admire your background because again, you were E1 to yeah. where you ended up 27 years later. What, 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 what did you do well to work your way up that way as a follower that people can take away? Yeah. I mean, I think I just tried to execute everything I was tasked with to like the max of my abilities. So like, I almost tried to like take like a samurai, you know, type approach. Like I, I remember being on a ship and this was like before I went to buds and, uh, I mean the, the heads on a ship are just, they're not the best. They're, they're kind of nasty. Right. <laughs> he explained on <laughs> um, the heads are the bathroom on the ship. Right. So the, ba- they would develop like three or four inches of water on the deck and it would just swirl around your underwear and it's just gross. And like, so I was like E1, E2 have to clean the bathrooms. And, and then, oh, the other thing is like, sometimes there'd be no like hot water. And I remember like, there was a kid in my division that like wanted to be a seal, but he like wouldn't shave when there wasn't hot water. And I was just like, why would you like, you want to be a seal and like, you can't shave with cold water. Like, what are you like, what are you thinking you're getting into? Um, But I remember from a young age, like even like being like 19 and being like, and I actually thought about like the dropping bombs, like analogy. I was like, how can I be trusted to like talk to an aircraft and drop bombs if I can't like clean this bathroom like effectively. And so that would, I would say like, that would be like my one tip is like execute every task to the, you know, utmost of your ability, no matter how like, you know, mundane or unpleasant. Like, yeah, like in boot camp, I was like that with the bathroom at boot camp. Like it was like, I just took the dirtiest jobs and I tried to do my best. I dig it. What's probably before we wrap up the military section, what was, do you have a, do you have a best mission? I got to go into Ukraine in 2016, 2018. Yeah. 2018 and, and, and help out like kind of developing their maritime soft. I feel like that was a very unique chance to go do something very concrete. The training cell that we were able to set up there, I think, has definitely paid dividends in the conflict right now. Um, Are you still in touch with those guys? One of them unfortunately passed away. As a result of the conflict? Yeah. 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 But um, that was probably the main guy that I was in comms with. But yeah, they've had some great successes down there. And I I like to think, you know, we, we had some small part in that. But, you know, who knows? We got to go in, into Ukraine multiple times and kind of see the country, see the people, mm-hmm. culture, and then, you know, kind of contribute con- concretely to that, to that struggle. I didn't ask you in the beginning, I asked you like why you wanted to be a SEAL. We talked about Navy SEALs and Charlie Sheen. Yeah. But like looking back after 27 years, wrapping it up, what, what was it like? Why did you want to be a SEAL? And then 27 years later, did it, did it scratch the itch? Oh, yeah. Was it what you thought it was going to be? Yeah. So... I think so. I had a, you know, ridiculous imagination when I was a kid. I, I was reading like just lots of like pulp, like men's fiction. So there's this like guy, Mac Bolin, who was kind of like the Punisher. And it, and then there was like this group, Phoenix Force. One of the guys in the group was a SEAL. I like saw that world and I'm like, I think I can do that. I think I had the capability to do that. And then I, then my thought process, this is like, I don't know, this is like age 13, 14 me. I was like, well, I have the capability to do it. I should do it because if I don't do it, then I'm like wasting what I've been given as a human. 
And and if I do it, you know, if I try and I fall short, it's like, yeah, all right, cool, man, you tried. But so that was kind of why I wanted to do it. And and I was always like kind of called to serve the country. I think that was like the you know the biggest thing is like that um you know the Taylor Swift quote of uh you know people sleep safely in their beds at night because rough men stood stand ready to do violence <laughs> on their behalf. I think it was Taylor Swift that said that. I think you're right. But I always want to be like one of those rough men. I'm like that's like that seems like you know you're just kind of a guardian. You're kind of a steward. So I was attracted to doing that service, and then I think. You know, I definitely stayed in as long as I did just because of the caliber of the people that you you get to serve with. You know, like that's like you're just like with these amazing humans and like, you know, this will like segue into the, the fiction writing section. But like you're just with these humans that like if I tried to write some of the people that we have served with, it's like you're, people would be like that. It's people too, think you're lying. That person's like too ridiculous. Yep. And and you're like, no, that's actually like a real like the, there are real people that are this ridiculous, ridiculous in a way of like. I cannot believe like how amazing you are as a human that kind of way. But yeah, so I stayed in as long as I did just because of the caliber of the people. So, you know, I feel very grateful that I was able to do that. I don't know how else to feel except just gratitude that I got to have the career I did. Rock on. So segueing into writing, we'll talk about reading first. So we're in your, your room right here from the floor <laughs> to the ceiling is stacked inch to inch with books. Yeah. No rhyme or reason. Every subject, yeah. every era, it, it's, it's pretty pretty strong so i guess one question i've always wondered about how do you best like internalize all the little bits of wisdom or information you want mm. from all these different books yeah is there a proprietary method you have that you've learned through a lifetime of reading? <laughs> the general answer is i think a lot of it is just getting subconsciously internalized so i'm not a cognitive scientist but that's a great caveat right but i think there's a lot of like stuff in our brains that are happening below the conscious level so a lot of the stuff like I'll read and I'll just forget. And that's probably, there's probably a way to optimize that. But when I do try to capture stuff more mindfully, you know, I underline, I write, you know, I engage in the margins of the text as a way to kind of like have a conversation with, you know, with the writer. And then I'll, you know, I'll try to connect to other things. So obviously like the book, you know, how to read a book is an amazing book to read. That kind of teaches you how to, you know, different levels of reading. You know, you can kind of really skim it and kind of just read, read the table of contents. You know, a lot of like pop science books really should just be like a long article. They shouldn't be, you know, a full length book, but publishers kind of want a book to be a certain length. Mm. So they have to kind of like buff it out with a bunch of fluff. So like if you're reading like a popular science book, you can probably just, you know, get the high points from, you know, the intro conclusion and read some of the main chapter headings. But besides that, like books that I've really tried to engage with, I'll like, I'll underline, I'll go through. I've seen like, I think Shane Parrish of Farnham Street, like he advocates like, as soon as you finish a book, you know, go to the front and like jot down like, you know, five things you took away from it. I haven't incorporated that technique yet, but I think that's a very valuable one. Obviously, if you're on Kindle, you can highlight, export all that stuff to a document. I don't like reading on Kindle. I mean, I think it's great. Like people do that. I think it's a great way to have a lot of books. I just like that I'm more of like an analog guy and obviously I'm ready for the zombie apocalypse. I'm trying to prepare, you know, a collection of, of knowledge to preserve for future generations after the, uh, after the descent into savagery, after I underline, um, then I'll usually like, I'll kind of type out a document that I'm trying to summarize the main points. And some of them I've been like putting out on my Substack summaries I've done. And that's kind of the best way. And then the other thing I really, I'm big on like commonplace notebooks. So what I love to do is like fill out a notebook full of just random stuff, tidbits that you, you collect. So I've got like, I'll, sh I'll show you the notebooks after this, man. Like they're just ridiculous. And I'll, and then there's like a weird scrapbooking fetish, I think for my mom where like, I'll, I'll print, you know, I'll t print out like graphics and like images and like paste them in there. And it's just, it gets like real weird, but it's just me trying to like externalize my brain a little bit into notebooks. And then you can kind of periodically reread them and kind of, you know, that will like kind of access the, the larger body that's kind of waiting there below the surface. But that's just a way to like try to, you know, connect everything like synthetically 
connect different domains, you know, and then I used note, the notes app, like I've, I'd experiment with Evernote, but I got like, I got hacked once and I just did not like that feeling no that somebody else had like access to it for a couple hours. Right. So I'm like, I'm done. So I, I just use Apple notes and like, I have like, you know, probably two or 3000 notes of just random things. And then I can kind of keyword search that. I think I'm just, you know, where, when I grew up, when and where I grew up, I'm just an analog guy. So I like, you know, I, I like to write it down. I like to highlight physical books and that's kind of the method that I think works. And there's, you know, there's some cognitive science research that says that that's a better way to do it. You know, writing things out longhand vice typing them, but you know, who, who knows? I think the bottom line is like people will figure out what works for them and hopefully it'll go. Yeah. Okay. And then you, you're obviously a writer. We'll dig into that, but I wondered, do you see a difference between reading as a reader and reading as a writer? Was there a pivot at which you're like, all right, I'm, I, this is interesting. I'm consuming information, but now you're looking at a book as well, that was an interesting way to think about it, how to phrase a sentence, how to articulate mm -hmm. a point. Do you see a differential there? When you read, do you think about writing? Yes, without a doubt. So when you're, when you're just a reader, you know, cause I've, I've been writing since I was 10, but like really writing seriously, probably the last like five years to where I'm like devoted to it, like every day. And I think, so when you're just a consumer, you just kind of like, unconsciously know that you like something or you don't like something and you don't really th stop to think why and maybe like something will bother you about something you read but you don't quite know why or you get bored and you stop reading but you don't like stop to figure out why something bores you or or you didn't like something so that now on the writer side I'm actually like digging into that deeply and figuring out like the nuts and bolts of why do people think that's boring why do they think it's not compelling like you go back through like your favorite books and like be like, why do I like this so much? Like, what is it about the sentence construction, the conflict, the tension? Like, what is it that's attracting me to this, to this work? Do you feel like you get to know a writer to a certain point, the more you read their works? Like you're writing a novel. Mm. It's almost impossible to write a novel without someone reading it and then knowing something about your soul because mm -hmm. you're recreating the world, your own characters, your own dialogue, your own philosophy. Do you, do you get that impression when you're reading something? You're like, well, I actually could, I understand this author, not just the author's point. I think it's important, like as a writer, I should, I should note, I should like put this like public service announcement that like whatever, you know, just because an author has a character that says something, it doesn't mean that the writer agrees with that. And I think that a lot of people are like, well, you know, they had a character that said this, so they think that. And it's like, no, that, you know, they're just using the characters as a foil to talk about something in reality. So but yes, to your point, like, yes, you absolutely, you get to know somebody's mind in the course of reading their, you know, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. I got a, a teenage daughter and, you know, she used to be a big reader. Now she's not really a big reader. And, and I'm trying to help her understand that, like, reading is reading, like, allows you a depth of understanding that's not available through the video, you know, the visual medium. So like, you know, it's great. We can have TikToks, we can have YouTube, we can learn stuff. And yes, in like, you know, like a three hour video, like you can get like pretty in depth in something, right? What a novel gives you is like, you know, access to other characters, mental states, their their interiority. And you can't even really do that in a movie unless you like have like the voiceover with like their thoughts. Um, You can't get to it as well as a novel. So what I try to explain to her is like, you know, a novel or, you know, short story gives you interiority, gives you like access to other ways of like seeing reality and that just helps you because like you're just you just have one way of seeing reality but like reading those other works adds to your like cognitive toolbox so you can be going through life and you're like wait a minute oh this looks like situation y that this other character went through and really like moving forward like reading deeply is going to be a competitive advantage for humans as we as we begin our slow descent into idiocracy maintain you know and we start putting gatorade on crops you know, reading deeply is going to help us understand and engage with the complexities of the world. So going backwards, you said since you were a kid, you were writing. I didn't realize you started that young. When did you first remember start writing? Yeah. So, so the first story, well, so my aunt typed out a story that I wrote when I was 10. So I don't know if I wrote it when I was like nine and she typed it out when I was 10 or if I wrote it, but I like distinctly remember my grandparents were watching my sister and I, and they had another couple over at their house. And then I remember explaining to like the, the woman about the story idea I had and like helicopters were coming down to like pick people up. 
And I remember like looking into her eyes and like her eyes like widened because she was like, who, who are you? And like, why, why are you talking about helicopters landing and like the turnaround of the street? And, and I remember like, kind of like, I made the like leap of like, wow, this is like weird that I'm not, you know, nine. And I'm like telling her this story because I could kind of see it through her eyes. But yeah, so I've been doing that since then. What is like ultimately your goal with writing? It's not just a hobby. It's not just a vague interest. You've been doing it since you were 10. And yeah. You're doing it with a super intensity. What is the overarching goal? I think I've always just been drawn to tell stories. Yeah, I think initially I started, I wanted to be like, I just want to tell like die hard. You know, like I want to write like action. That's what I wanted to do. Really wasn't like into like literary fiction when I was a kid. So I, and I wasn't like, I didn't understand that you can actually like, help people live better lives through writing fiction. So now I think that's definitely like, you know, when I'm writing fiction, I'm looking to kind of like help people make sense of reality and then like, you know, chart a better course through reality. And then with the nonfiction, like I've just been very like surprised that I'm writing nonfiction at all. Cause I wasn't like expecting it. I was like, what, why am I writing like nonfiction essays? As you know, like writing is a way to like externalize your thinking and sharpen your thoughts sharpen your ideas about the world. So that's a big part of it is like, I'm writing out stuff to learn it, to process it. And then hopefully someone else is getting like utility from it as well. It's something that struck me was the difference between writing as a writer and writing as a thinker. And okay. there are, I think, two substantial differences there. I think some people look at writing and they treat writing as how beautifully can I write as opposed to can I genuinely offer something you need a different uh, perspective and originality. Get into your head, yeah. Which I think you're trying to do in your novel from the little bit you've let me read. So, like, yeah. do you do you ever think about that? Has it ever come across your mind? Writing just to be like flowery. I think probably because that writing is like never really attracted me. Like writing that's just designed to be, I don't know, like very beautiful in itself. And that's I see it infecting me. That's why I ask. Because sometimes I'm like, I, I get so obsessed about can I make the sentence attractive. I almost forget the overarching point. It's very knuckle draggery. I didn't know if it ever hit you. Yeah, I'm trying to like get better by writing simpler. My earlier writing, like I definitely write like in kind of like this pretentious, like overwriting style. And and so I think I'm trying to get like to simplify my writing, both fiction and nonfiction. So fiction is a unique beast. And I'm, I'm curious, how did you learn certain skills of like using the right person? Mm -hmm. Which there's like, you could write books on the use of the right person, first, second, third. Yeah the omnipotent narrator or different types of narrators crafting even just crafting a plot like there are books written on how to do that kind of thing um i definitely like a, you know i'm a journeyman on the process of becoming a good writer right and so what i see right now in the market from my you know limited newbie perspective is just third person limited which is like you're just in a pov for a, a chapter and then you can like jump to you know a chapter a scene and then jump to a different POV for later ones or first person, right? So you're like directly in the head. Cause I think people today really want that interiority. I think they're like hungry for that interiority. And I just, I think that like sucks you in better than like omnipotent. So, so that's where I'm kind of focusing my efforts on right now. And I've until now I've just done third limited. And I think I'll probably shift to some first because I think people like first as well. It depends on like, you know, what your, your goal is with the story. So if you're like, I want to talk about forgiveness or, you know, I want to talk about, you know, the power of, or, the, you know, the dangers of bad decisions. You want to start with like a thread of like, what is the thing I want to talk about? And then from there you can like germinate a character that can best denote that, right? That will suggest the, you know, the delivery mechanism in the form of the character. How do you actually articulate the scenery from the first person point of view? Yeah. So, and again, like I am, I am no expert. I'm just like a newbie. So there's a million ways to do it. But I think what I try to do is, you know, I, I've like developed a lot of like, I think just probably being in the military, it's like an interesting being military and then being a writer, like you, you bring the like discipline of the military into the writing. So like I've developed all these like, you know, PowerPoints and like Excel spreadsheets of like, how do you develop a character and then kind of overlay that over like their perception. So, and I really like using the, uh, 
Enneagram, which is like this, like, you know, woo Enneagram is like this woo personality thing that basically has like these nine different personality types. And they, it kind of, I will use that for like a baseline and then almost like from Jungian psychology. Yeah. There's definitely like Jungian flavors in it, but like basically it'll just kind of like give you like these different archetypes of characters that temperaments basically. So like, what is your temperament? Is your temperament to like nurture and protect? Is it to go out there and be ambitious? Is it to be like a loyal friend? You know, like there's different, different tendencies and inclinations, I would say in these Enneagram. So you can, and and this is, this example is, you know, you can use that. You can use like five factor psychological personality, right? Like the ocean model, like openness to experience, conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, extroversion, introversion. You can use that too, right? So you like, you make a character and then you obviously like create the backstory. And then I think how deep you go depends on how important the character is, right? So if it's your main character, you're going to be writing pages and pages. You're going to know their birthday. You're going to know like traumatic events from their childhood. You're going to know, you know, what happened in third grade, you know, in gym class. If it's just like a side character, you're not going to devote as much to it. But, you know, are they like cynical? Are they optimistic? Are they, you know, temperamental? Like, are they on a diet and they're just angry? You know, so you'll kind of like think of all these different tendencies. And then those tendencies will be almost like colored glasses that the character is wearing. So they're looking at the world through the the prism of those characteristics. So, you know, one person may look at somebody mowing a lawn and be like, that's so nice. I love that sound. It reminds me of summer and I love the smell of cut grass. It's so great. And then another person, another person will say, God, this thing is so noisy and it's just like ruining my life right now. And this guy's an idiot. So like those characteristics will kind of color what you're taking into the world. So um, the cognitive scientist, Jonathan Verveke talks about relevance realization. And what that is, is like what salient details you're taking in about the world to, you know, to make sense of the world. Right. So you and I like may work some things we, we key on are going to be similar and some things are going to be different, but each character is like that. Um, And so you, the trick is like finding the characteristics of that character and then showing the sensory details from that, you know, from that, you know, maybe they're trying to quit smoking and they're like craving a cigarette and that's making them cranky. So you kind of like put that flavor into Mm. how they're describing the world. And then obviously like, you know, then you have like the, um, you know, unreliable narrator, like, you know, you know, Gone Girl, you know, those type of of stories where like they're just the characters not portraying reality to the reader effectively. And then like once you figure that out, you're like, okay, wait, now I need to like take everything that I'm reading with a grain of salt. That's not maybe totally how, how it's being portrayed. Are you sort of developing a, a writer's brain at this point where every interaction you have, every time you set out set foot outside the house, go to the grocery store, have a conversation. Are you cataloging experiences and sounds and conversations and ideas is a change in the way you look at the world. Oh, I mean, it definitely, yeah, it definitely does because you have to bring in like, you have to have a Rolodex of like stuff and and, like kind of seeing how, because like there, you know, if it's just me, then it's like, I'm bound by like, you know, books I've read or like movies I've seen. And that gets like very cliched very quickly. Right. Cause everybody will just write like these tropes. So yeah, like paying attention when you're out in life for like, turns of phrase like the way that people talk and then you can kind of bring that back into your your individual work yeah so you, you, the rolodex is interesting so you're not only trying to accumulate real world experiences to integrate into your books you also have like we just talked about 27 years worth of military experience overseas mm-hmm. different countries different missions different statuses different roles how much i guess if you could lay a percentage on it how much do you recall from your past mm-hmm. versus what you're observing in the modern day Yeah. So, and what, you know, what's interesting is like when you read all this advice from writers, right? Like they, they all start to collapse around certain, like very common things. And like, you know, one of them is obviously like, just go out in life and get experience. So Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you can start being a writer at age 20, but it helps to kind of have a lot of life experience. So, and that's one thing that the military gives you in spades. And obviously like, you don't need the military to like, you know, there's plenty of people that get lots of life experiences from other ways, but like, the benefit of the military is like you get to travel the world. So you're seeing like all these different cultures and the different ways of being. 
you're seeing like crazy situations, you're seeing crazy people, and all that can kind of go in there and and inform your, you know, your creative brain. Because I think like life is so dynamic. So if you want to write certain timeless themes you can write about, but like if you're trying to keep up with the times, like it's like, you know, I got to pay attention to my daughter. I got to be like interrogating her like Sears school style to like figure out how she thinks, right? Like Gen Z, like how does a Gen Z see the world, which is totally different than me. Like I'm a cusp, but like I'm an ex millennial cusp. Like I see the world totally differently than a Gen Z person. So like I need to like understand how they're looking at the world because that will inform you know, everything. You're crushing fiction. You're hitting the personal essay thing. You do a lot of book reviews, which I super dig because you're, 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 you're summarizing these books down to the core essence. You've done your thesis. You've done, you're doing another thesis. Like if you gave advice to writers, which obviously mm-hmm. you're saying you're a newbie, which you're being, you're being modest. Do you recommend people experiment with everything? Does it make them better? Should you be a specialist? What are your thoughts on that? I had a writing teacher that used to always say like, he was quoting somebody else. And I think it might've been Taylor Swift when when he said nobody knows anything and and i think what he meant by that was what works for somebody may not work for somebody else so like i think i'm very hesitant to like say you know do x y and z but certain things like certain people may be more like you know diary style entries travel log certain people may be you know fiction you know essays so it's i think like dabble with it all but i've i've always like even like writing my master's thesis, I was like, this is still writing. You know, I'm like, it's like, you know, with jujitsu and like, you know, if you take like a wrestler, right. And then he goes into jujitsu, like he's got the mat hours, you know, he's got like the mat hours on the, you know, so he, all he's got to do is really like memorize the moves. And he already has that like intuitive awareness of the body. So I think the same thing with writing. I'm like, even if I'm writing nonfiction, that's like contributing to my fiction. Cause I'm getting like the reps and the mat hours. I'm broken wrong. Do what is your like? What's your soul type? Is that fiction? I I don't know. You know, like I thought it was, but I you know it's like I don't know. Like I think I'm, I've got to be like humble enough to be like, yeah, like I don't know, man. You know, you're just gonna turn into like whatever you're gonna turn into. So like I want to write fiction. I've got you know the first novel's done, trying to sell it, and then the second got the second novel, the Heavenly Tunnel, is it's coming along, and then obviously like all the short stories I've been writing, I'm just been really helping get the reps in. But yeah, like the nonfiction, like who knows? Like I could be, I could be writing nonfiction. Like I don't know yet. So random one, but like I read a great Orwell quote. He said something to the effect of all writing is political in nature. Do you think that that is a thing? There's, I think there's a difference in writing with like a political motive in mind and then just writing to kind of like try to reveal reality in all of its like blemishes and imperfections. And I think both can be political. I think if you go overtly political, it's like scratch and poison ivy. You know, it's like, oh, this feels so good, man. Oh, let's freaking own the libs. Let's do this. Let's crush, you know, these cuck conservatives. Like it's like, it feels great, it, you know, and there's an audience for it, right? So you can be captured by an audience, but it's just not like, I don't know how helpful that is. Or if you're just like screaming into the void. So I would rather be like, I'm going to try to be honest with like, yeah, man, there's no like easy solutions here. There's like problems with both parts of whatever it is. So try to illustrate it as like complex as you can, I would say is the way to go. It seems like some of the writers that are some of the most intense and prolific, they have like a strong write, revise, rewrite process, and they do it obsessively Mm -hmm. night and day for years. Yeah. Is that, do you fall into that? So I, yeah. So when I, Like I said, with this novel, like I wrote it in, I first wrote it in 2011 and it was a novella. It was about 30,000 words. And I totally scrapped that and did what's called a page one rewrite, which is like, you totally start from scratch, rewrote it with all new characters in like 2020 ish to 2022. And then send it, sent that through developmental editors. And then, you know, I was reading one of these books was like rewrite, don't revise. And, and I, you know, and I was like, that freaking hurts. Yeah. Cause it's like, and they're like, you can, it's okay to like have it up on the screen, but you're typing like new sentences from scratch. I'm like, oh, wow. That like, I know that that is the right thing to do, but that sounds so painful. So after the pair of developmental editors, I did mostly, I would say I did like 75% rewrite and like 25% revise for that draft. 
and it made it like just so much better doing it that way. And it's like weird. It's like you're t- like the first draft, like the zero draft is like you're telling yourself the story. And then and I even have to have I even had to have like one of the editors was like, I think this is about trust. And I'm like, I'm like, OK, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I guess it is. And it's like <laughs> I but I like was not I did not set out to write like about trust. And it was like reflected back to me. Right. So and then like once that happened, then I can kind of be like, OK, I can be more mindful about, you know, salting that in in later drafts. So like the first draft is like, you know, it carves a little channel. And then as you write the successive drafts, mm-hmm. that channel is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And you're honing in on the signal and you're separating the signal from the noise. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So revising is, you know, to me, it's like that is where the, the magic is, is like the rewriting, the revising. Um, It's just getting so much stronger and like, you know, getting critiques from the writing groups is just so helpful because you're like, you're figuring out like how it's landing with people. What about like getting your, your brain in the zone for writing? So I look mm. at it two different ways. Like what are, what are one or two or three things you do to prime your brain for writing? And then when you're actually writing, is there you know, music, location, certain ways you stay in a flow state? Yeah. So how, do you, how do you think about that? Yeah. So, and I, so this is like another, like, you know, nobody knows anything question. Like, so I think everybody's got their niche. It's going to be different for everybody, I would say. Right. And, and people have different situations, right? Like, so I'm married. I have three kids. Like, I've got to work around you know, the hand I've been given. Right. So that means like a lot of times it's like get up at four 30 and then like, you know, you can write for a couple hours before the kids get up. I don't really like staying up late anymore just cause I'm like old. And I like to just, I'd much rather like, you know, go to bed early and get up early than like stay up late. But other people obviously like have different views on that. Like actually one of these, one of these books is like great routines of like famous artists. And, it, and I've got like a chart, like a graphic somewhere that's got an analysis of, you know, famous, this guy, this guy or girl did an analysis of like famous artists and was like, wh- you know, when did they, they got up? When did they exercise? When did they sleep, party? You know, when did they do their work? And invariably it's like either early morning or late night, you know, was when the creative work is getting done. So whatever works for you, I would say do that. Uh, for me, I need to give myself a deadline. In terms of music, yeah, like I think music would be distracting when I'm actually writing, but when I'm like ideating, music is amazing. So, um, yeah, like a lot of times, like I'll go out and like walk, listen to music, like walk out in the woods, listen to music, have a couple drinks, you know, your altered state inducer of choice, I would say, if, if you're trying to get creative and then you can ideate there. But then when you're like executing, you know, Music usually just kind of distracts me, but silence is probably like the best thing for, for that. In terms of like, yeah, what primes me, I dig into like, I'm a heavy, like, you know, create like dossiers and like outlines and plans. So kind of dig into the, uh, the source documents to help, you know, understand the story deeper. I can't write in the morning because I have nothing in my brain. It's almost like it's just empty. So I just train right when I wake up. Do you, do you have to, do you have to get the wheels spinning or like, mm. do you wake up prime, just let's fucking go. And you start putting words on paper in terms of fiction writing. Like what helps me is just having an outline and then, you know, kind of putting yourself on, on a deadline. And I've been amazed, like, cause it, you know, when you're talking about fiction, there's like, you know, plotters and pantsers. So definitely like, you know, mean? so a plotter would be somebody that, and then Brandon, Brandon Sanderson, the fantasy writer, he calls it world builders disease, which is like you spend so much time building the world and you're like not actually writing. So plotting heavily is like, you're just making a heavy outline. Like some people write like a 30 page outline of their novel, you know, or longer that says, you know, every scene. And then some people are pantsers or like, you know, more like kind of gardening, I guess. And they're just like, well, we're just going to see what happens. Okay. The character walked down the street and then there was a bar in the alley and he went in the bar and he met this person and they're just kind of like flowing and sending it. And both of those approaches have pros and cons. Most writers are somewhere in the middle and the, the pantsers generally have to do like more heavy revision on the backside. Whereas like the plotters can kind of get, you know, they can do like less drafts. I think typically that's how it ends up. Most people are like plantsers, kind of like a mix of plotter and pantser. So for me, what I've just found in my place in the writer journey is like, it's almost like a scene in a movie if you can like block out the scene where like, okay, the character's standing here, the char- this character's standing here, like she wants X, he wants Y, go. And like, you've kind of already like, if you can like 
create like a paragraph that like salts in all the conflict, you can just freaking roll and you can like knock a couple thousand words out quickly. Whereas if you're just kind of discovery writing, like you can kind of just get stuck. But if you know, like, okay, here's where they're starting the scene. He wants a cup of water. She doesn't want to give it to him. And then like at the end of the scene, this is where they end up. Then you can like, that just helps you create so much faster. I so, take it. Yeah. You want to talk about the novel? Or you want to keep that one? I don't do like Twitter at all. Like I, like I have a Twitter account, but I don't like tweet at all. But there was like a pitch contest thing. And, and so I wrote, I wrote a, like a couple sentences for it. It was like, when a succession contest turns deadly inside an Art Deco skyscraper, a disgraced Navy SEAL and his dog must, you know, fight to survive to save his relationship with his daughter. I think that was like how I tried to sum up like the entire novel in like one sentence. Oh, and then I put like Squid Game times Dante's Inferno times John Wick. Like that was like the, uh, if I was trying to give you like the aesthetic, like the flavor of it. So it's a recreation of Dante's Inferno in a skyscraper, all the, all the different levels. And then uh, a group of individuals that are going through almost like a reality show competition for leadership of this nonprofit foundation it takes a deadly turn and then it becomes, you know, life and death. And then the protagonist and his allies have to kind of navigate through there, through the end, and then, and kind of work through all of their challenges. So I think that's like the quickest way I can describe it. From the, yeah. from the bit I've read it, I never felt like I was inside the mind of a team guy, of a SEAL. Yeah. Like the way you articulated his psychology and his thought process and his whole vibe, his whole, his whole sense of life. Yeah. I'm fucking stoked to read the whole thing. So I can't wait for it to come out. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. So it's still, yeah, I'm in the query trenches. Like it is, it's rough to like just get lots of rejections. So it's, but it's like a great, it's just part of the process as like a, a writer is like just getting rejected, but it actually like getting rejected is like, it's cool. Like I'm like on the process, you know, I have something to be rejected for, yeah. right? Going through that is like, you just kind of got to develop thick skin and just not be too demoralized by it and kind of, you know, realize like, Hey, I've written a good novel. I'm waiting, you know, I'm just finding the right moment for it to come out and it'll, you know, and that's where you just got to kind of be like, it's going to unfold the way it's going to unfold. And, um, getting back to the stoicism, like, you know, my locus of control is only so much. So I need to just focus on that. Love it. Pivot a little bit. Basic. I love asking these questions. Workout <laughs> program. Do you have a, you have three kids. Yeah. You just got out of 27 years. Do you have a workout program you're on right now or just. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. It's definitely not as good as it could be in the morning. I'll just do like light type calisthenics, like just with a kettlebell and some mobility stuff to like get ready for the day. You know, I'm like mid forties. So I'm just trying to like, you know, after a body just destroyed right now, yeah, just body just yeah. destroyed by, by a career. So yeah. So just like light calisthenics. Uh, and then I really, I've been getting into like, you know, walking with a ruck now. Like I really enjoy yeah. that. So like, you know, try to go on like five mile rucks, you know, whenever I can. And, and then, you know, what's cool about that. You can listen to podcasts, you can listen to music and just think. Do you carry a notebook? Do you got ideas? And start no, writing? but so what I'll do, <laughs> so what I'll do is it's like, there's probably a more efficient process, but I'll like text myself on my watch. Okay. Like I'll be like, you know, and, and it's like, and it's so embarrassing because I have to like say like my name incorrectly because it won't respond <laughs> to it. If I say, so I have to be like text Adam Curio goes <laughs> and it'll like, so it'll send me a text like with my idea and then I'll just like collect it later. It's probably a more efficient way to do that. But yeah, that's where I'm at right now. What about technology? What's your relationship like with your smartphone, your yeah. whole watch? Do you, so, oh, do you yeah. set times at the end of the day? Uh, How do you regulate it? This is a topic that I spent a lot of time like thinking about just because the environment has just fractured humans' attention. So I like, I really like, I rail about this in some of my writing. You know, we're, we're being drowned. Like I was telling you, like even when you're pumping your gas and there's like a commercial like blathering at you, that is just like such pollution of your mind and like giving you time to just have some peace and solitude. So I wanted to get rid of a smartphone, just get like, um, there's this thing called the light phone. I was going to get that. You turned me on to that. I'm looking at this. Yeah. So I thought about it, but like, I, you know, I'll do, I'll do a bunch of random zooms. And so I like having the smartphone to do zooms. You know, my sense of a direction is just straight embarrassing. It's like, probably it's just, I mean, I like, you know, cringe to talk about it. It's just awful. So I do need, um, direction finding. And then I love like podcasts. I love like, you know, informational YouTube videos. So what I did was like, I took email and all social media off of the smartphone. And so if I want to like even check my email, I have to like do it on my laptop. 
as you've talked about, like you're sitting in the stoplight and you're like, oh, I got to check this. Like, so I'm trying to like actively eliminate that. And then what I just did was my wife had an Apple watch with a cell phone embedded in it and she wasn't using it. So I just stole it from her and like match it to my account. So what I'm trying to do is just have like headphones and an Apple watch and then just roll through life like that. And like, not even like leave the house, like not even have a cell phone on me at all. So you can text, you yeah. can call, but you can't get onto apps or whatever. Right, yeah. So you can like listen to podcasts, you can listen to music, you can yeah get directions, text, phone call with all that. But so, no internet. Yeah. You can't like browse like Safari. That's my n- initial plan right now to further remove that from my life. Right. And then what I do is like at night, you know, I have everything obviously like, you know, put, you know, no notifications. So that's not just, except for like, you know, I'll let like, you know, the wife and kids will be like the only message notifications yeah. that can kind of get through the wall. And then at night, like what I've been doing is like just leaving it in my office. Cause there's like, you know, there was a point in my life where like I was important enough that like somebody needed to get in touch with me at midnight, but that, that period has passed. I'll just like leave my phone down in my office and it's like, Hey, if it's that, you know, I'll get it in the morning. Like there's nothing that's going to happen like right now that I need this tonight. Was that hard for you to break or did that come naturally? I mean, I think, you know, you were on call for a long time. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, initially like it was a challenge, but, but, you know, just realizing like there's nothing I need to respond to, you know, after like eight o'clock at night, absolutely not, you know, in bed, all I'm doing is like reading a book, you know, and then I'm also, and I'm trying to like, just read fiction, not even reading like nonfiction nice. so that you're like, just calming your mind down a little bit. And then in the morning, like I'm trying to like, not, you know, check anything until I do like, you know, a little morning routine of like reading, you know, journaling, like nothing insane, you know, just like, that's a, I'm you so know, bad at that. I need to do what you just said. Let's do some rapid fire to wrap it up. All right. So one person alive or dead, you would want to have a conversation with and why? Man, I would say... Hey, I don't know. There's so many like ways you can go with this, but I would say like Lao Tzu, uh, oh, cool. the guy who wrote, supposedly wrote the Tao Te Ching, you know, like I would say him probably, that'd be kind of weird because he's like speaking Chinese and I'm like speaking English. We just like sit there and look at each other. And then I would say next would be like Alan Watts. I would like to sit and talk to him. Um, just a philosopher from the 60s and 70s. Let's say top three books that have changed your life. First, I'll go Tao Te Ching some reason that like really resonated with me. Like my grandparents had like a bookshelf in their basement and like that was on the bookcase. Cause I didn't grow up like very religious at all, but like reading that, I'm like, wow, there's really something here that I'm attracted to. I think it's like a really interesting way to perceive reality. So every time I read that, I get more out of it. So I, I would say that. And then I would say Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I've, I just really, really love that book. I probably read it three times but yeah it's it's amazing um, and then the last one i would say is shibumi that one is kind of an action thriller i think it's part of it's like where i found it you know i found it on this in the galley of a ship in the middle of the indian ocean and it was almost like you know i was like supposed to find this book you know i'm like oh i need something to read and then there's like this tattered copy of shibumi yeah that would be like the third one i would say like so yeah two nonfiction and one fiction Top three movies that changed your life. I mean, there's so many like campy movies that I want to say right now. Like, I just love Big Trouble in Little China. Like, I'm like, like that is the most campiest, most ridiculous movie ever. But I'm like, if I could ever write Big Trouble in Little China, I would just die a happy man. Um, but in terms of like serious movies, like I would say I love The Deer Hunter. Weird as movies like that are not pro war. Right. They make guys they yeah. made me want to go to war. Right. <laughs> no, they're yeah, they're absolutely and that was like, I think that was the country just trying to process Vietnam. Yeah. Like it was just kind of starting to think about it then. But like any great piece of like, you know, of art, you know, it, it just it helps you see the world in a new way and like mm-hmm. reframe it. So Apocalypse Now, like I don't want to make it like it seems like I'm like this is like Vietnam like war movies, but that like was so good. Yeah, but like Apocalypse Art. Yeah. So Apocalypse Now, like I don't know what it is about, you know, I've watched it with guys on deployment and you're like, you know, smoking cigars, like watching that movie, you know, there's just a something about it that it's giving me goosebumps thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. No. So it's like, that would be in that list. 
also very partial to like Wes Anderson movies. I don't know why. Like my wife and I will definitely like watch. Yeah, we like we love all those because they're very like I would say meta modern. Like they're trying to like I don't know. There's something about them that we enjoy. But anyways, that would be like <laughs> that would be my list. One piece of advice to an undesignated seaman. I think clean clean the bathrooms to drop bombs is probably one of the best things I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> so like what what is one piece of advice to give to someone who's literally working the way up from the bottom right now? Yeah, I think just, you know, know where you want to go and and then just work. I don't want that to sound like trite or cliched, but it's like I talked to like a friend's baseball team and like, you know, I was talking about like perseverance and it's just like, you know, anything that we do, like, you know, you're going to suck in the beginning and it's going to take a lot of hard work to get there. So like everything that we do, you know, like there's very few things that you're like, oh, I'm naturally talented at this. Like, it's so easy. Everything we do in life is just going to take a lot of work and get in the trenches. It can be demoralizing and like, you know, you can want to like give up and there are certain things you should give up. Like, so it's like, we, you know, it's like hard to like find the nuanced. There's no absolute, like never give up. Like, well, there's some things like you probably should give up because you're not like, you know, meant for that. So I would say know where you want to go and then, you know, put in the work. Where can people find you? What's your sub stack? Where, where oh. do you recommend they go? Yeah. So yeah, I've got a, just a website that's just got like, it's got, a, I don't really update the website too, too much, but you can like sign up for the sub stack on my website, uh, which is adamkraus.com. And then uh, uh, every name spelled. Yeah. yeah which is right uh, K-A-R-A-O-G-U-Z. Yeah. And then I have a sub stack. You can just look up like Renaissance humans. And that's kind of like what I'm, what I'm talking about. Like, I got tired of like, um, just complaining about things that were bad and i'm like i should just talk about like things that are good and like mm. i should just try to like manifest like you know the good that i want to see in the world so just talk about humans that are you know prepared for reality and like mind body and spirit so i think that's what i'm going for rock and roll you got anything else you want to add <laughs> no no it's been great great talking to you great to meet you in the flash all right appreciate it bro thanks man <laughs> yeah. that's it for this episode if you want to check out more from the podcast head to zeroeyes.com slash Nobel, where you can see show notes, read more about our guests, and suggest guests or topics of your own. Until next time, stay in the fight, don't ring the bell.